Welcome to our luncheon portion of today's program. We are so fortunate today to have a fabulous keynote speaker, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. And we're also so fortunate, as I look around the room, to see so many friends and supporters of the center. So I'd like just to take a moment um, to thank uh, some of those who are here today. Uh, I know from directing the center on a daily basis, I benefit greatly from the wisdom and counsel of people like Admiral Bob Inman and Larry Temple, who are here with us today. And uh, the people who make the center run are Paul Steckler, our director, director of research studies, Sherry Greenberg, who's been helping us all along and is now formally a part of the center. And I want to thank uh, Sonia Perez, who's here today from AT&T. The AT&T Foundation made our founding possible, and we are very grateful to them. And we are also grateful to Vianovo, uh, Blaine Bull, James Taylor, and the good folks at Vianovo who um, very generously supported today's event. So thank you to them. As we take an interdisciplinary approach to the study of politics and leadership, we benefit greatly from the many, many resources available at the University of Texas. We are so fortunate to be placed here. And uh, we're so, so grateful for the support of President Powers, who's here with us today. And uh, we want to thank him and the university for their continuing support of the center and its mission. So thank you, President Powers. Well, thank you all, and thank you, Ronnie. And I want to congratulate uh, everybody who's participated in this program. We had a tremendous session this morning. Um, the panel that we just had, some of the speakers are still on it, uh, was something I think all citizens in the state should have seen, serious discussion, uh, cooperative discussion of the challenges that lie ahead of us. And I think we ought to give them a hand before we start the program as well. And we have a real treat with our keynote speaker today at lunch. And it's a great honor and privilege for me to introduce our keynote speaker, our senior senator from the state of Texas, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. She has been a ardent and outstanding supporter of higher education. And that's gone on throughout her entire public life. She's been a champion of funding scientific and technological research. She's worked to increase the amount of federal funding that flows to Texas and to Texas universities. Uh, her support for a variety of projects, many of them on our campus, many of them in the medical schools, many of them around the state, have shown her to be a true leader in supporting scientific research and the results have been there. During her tenure in the Senate and through her efforts, Texas has moved to third in the nation in federal research funding and development expenditures. And I know she would be the first to tell you that's not where we're going to stop, uh, but second and first. Senator, you've been a tremendous supporter in that effort. Senator Hutchison has also been a prime mover in creating an organization called TAMIST, the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas. TAMIST recognizes our state's highest achievers in the fields of science and math and medicine and engineering. Uh, and it works to build a stronger identity for Texas as a national center in those areas. The senator was an early advocate for high-tech industry in our state, and she's been an effective voice in foreign policy, veterans affairs, and national security issues. She so foresaw our nation would need scientific countermeasures to chemical and biological threats, and she saw that three years before 9-11. And she saw that we needed research support in those areas. We're very proud. She's a graduate of our great university. I'm proud that she's a graduate of our great law school. She is one of our distinguished alumni, the recipient of our distinguished alumnus awards. She's shown exceptional leadership in helping this nation both imagine and realize its future. She's a tireless public servant, 
and it is a great honor, Senator, to have you here today to address this group. Please welcome our senior Senator, Kay Bailey Hutchinson. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Bill. You are doing such a wonderful job, and uh, some of the things that, that we have worked on are so exciting, and the fact that you have that science background has been a big help, even though you painted your resume being the dean of the law school is correct, but nevertheless, uh, we've had a great time. Um, I've been looking at your program and uh, know that you all want to talk a little bit about um, not only the effect on Texas politics, but and I, which I understand you've talked a lot about already, but uh, you know also the national thing, which of course uh, I would be tied into. So I'll try to do a little of both, but I will also take questions uh, from the audience uh, if you want to talk about something I didn't do. Now, starting with the election on Tuesday night, I knew that it was going to be a bad night when the results of the Krispy Kreme election were announced and Obama had won. Now, if John McCain couldn't take the Donut Eaters co Conference, I knew that we were lost. Well, actually, I have to say that the election was certainly one that made history. I thought I mean, everybody could take this point or that point and say, well, it was bad. But I thought the election was conducted in a very high-minded way. And I think that the historic proportions, uh, the epic uh, uh, effect that the results of the election showed with the huge turnout, with the very clear message, with the laser beam focus that the American people had, all was for the good. And I think Barack Obama is just an extraordinary person. I have never seen someone with his experience level who kept his cool the whole time. He never faltered. And his message was clear. He didn't falter from that. And I think he ran a flawless campaign. And it, my gosh, if you look at where he started, when, when he announced, uh, all of us in the Senate thought Hillary would win the Democratic primary in a walk. And then he just kept going and going and going. It was a flawless, it was a flawless campaign. So I congratulate him. Uh, and I look forward to hoping that there will be a change in Washington for the better. That's what we should all hope for. I want to work in a constructive way. And I want to say um, a little bit about what I think Republicans ought to do and what Democrats ought to do in a few minutes, because I think uh, what we do is going to be dependent on what both sides do. So I think that we should take this moment and we should talk about uh, what he achieved and, and give him his due, because he deserves it. I, We'll start now by talking a little bit about Republicans and what would be the good news here for Republicans. <clears throat> it's not a blank page exactly, but it's close. Um, <laughs> what I would remind Republicans is really basically that politics is cyclical. So you always know that when you're at your darkest hour that it is just before dawn. And I would say in 1993, when Bill Clinton broke all the barriers uh, and was elected president in 1993, it was six months later, with my election to the United States Senate to replace Lloyd Benson, that the tide started turning. And so I think that as we have seen what happened at the national level, which of course now with the presidency and both houses of Congress increasing with Democrats, um, that you will begin to see the disappointment, the uh, expectations that were not realized. And so you will start seeing the, the honeymoon period wane. 
And so I think that that is uh, what Republicans need to look for. Now, it's not just going to wane, though, if Republicans sit there and expect it to. Uh, we can't let it wane uh, and think that Democrats are going to make a mistake or Barack Obama is going to overreach. We have to have a program, and I think that that program should include uh, what we have done in the past and have sort of in the last maybe four years um, walked away from. And that is we have been the party of big ideas. And it is time for Republicans to come back to the party of big ideas. It is also very important that Republicans reach out, that we recognize the change in demographics in our country and in our state of Texas, uh, that we make sure that we are looking at the youth vote and the problems that they see, and that we reach out for solutions that are both innovative and also that the young people or the people who are uh, minorities that are changing the demographics would want to be the solutions to the problem. So I think that Republicans uh, have gotten a little stale, and it is time for us to uh, look to ourselves, to see where we have become a little stale, and start talking to each other again. Now, when you do the... Um, what happened in the last few years, I think you can start uh, with where we were on 9-11 and go back from there. 9-11 um, was clearly the wake-up call of America. Our military was not ready for the kind of warfare we were in, so it took a complete revamping of our military. You know, we thought, really, after the Cold War, that really the Army and the Marines were going to be the, the secondary uh, part of our armed services, that every war was going to be at 30,000 feet. We thought that we were going to use the technology of laser-focused missiles, and we were going to be able to hit windows from 30,000 feet up, and that we would never have to really have trench warfare. And then, after 9-11, uh, we brought back the cavalry. We were riding horses again in Afghanistan. So we had to come back to and retool our military for a very different kind of enemy. Bobby Inman would um, certainly know more about that than most people in this room, including me. But that was something that we had to do. And that also started the process of the deficit spending. So we had a balanced budget before 9-11 of 2001. And we were on the glide path to doing the things that are really the Republican things that, that we wanted to do, like reform Social Security so that it would be solvent and secure for the next generations, um, which we could do with a balanced budget and with creative thinking. Same for Medicare. Uh, it was those bold visions that we were embarking on. But after 9-11, everything changed. And the focus began then to revamping the military, fighting a war on an enemy and a culture that we did not understand very well. And that has taken a lot of our time and effort. And it also started the deficit spending, which then has multiplied and multiplied. So I think it is time for us to start looking toward, again, the big solutions. But first, we have to deal with the issues that we have. And of course, with the new president, uh, we will be beginning to uh, see where he wants to lead. Now, that is for the Republicans. The Democrats uh, now have the responsibility. And if, if I or George W. Bush or anybody else who has uh, observed for the last few years in Washington, it is that it, no matter what happens, and no matter who's at fault, or whether Congress was uh, lagging or not lagging, or what Congress was doing, if it was good or if it was bad, the blame goes to the president. There is no question that because we've had the war on terror after 9-11, we've had gasoline prices go up, 
we've had the mortgage meltdown and then the financial meltdown, it all went to the party and to the president. So now the Democrats will be in complete control. It will be the White House plus both houses of Congress with uh, almost a veto proof, I mean almost a filibuster uh, uh, proof Senate, although not quite, and uh, much larger margins in the House. Now, what I would say, or the Democrats is, that it's the same thing that maybe the Republican uh, advice would be, and that is, we are a center-focused country. And Republicans need to remember that, and so do the Democrats. I think their danger is the overreach that could cause them to have the cycle start immediately to go in the other direction. So when you talk about bigger spending, raising taxes, and not taking care of the small business people and the entrepreneurs that have been the vibrance of our economy in this country, because our manufacturing base has basically gone overseas. What has kept our economy vibrant is the technology, the innovation, the creative ideas, and the jobs that that has produced. We must protect that. We must focus our spending on what will energize our economy. We've got to take uh, the approach that um, we can't overregulate and overtax our entrepreneurs so that they leave the country to do their work. And as Bill Powers mentioned, we've also got to make sure that in our higher education system that we are bringing our, our people up to keep that creativity. We've got to have the engineers, the scientists, the mathematicians um, in our society to keep that creativity. And what has happened in the last 15 years, approximately, maybe 20, uh, we have been losing that prowess. In 10 more years, 90% of the engineers in the world will live in Asia. That is not acceptable if we are going to maintain the vibrance of our economy. And that means we've got to not only attract the best minds from overseas to come here and go to school and do their work, we've also got to bring our own young people into the system, which means we've got to focus on K through 12 education because you can't start an engineering program if our graduating seniors from high school don't have the prerequisites. You've got to start in middle school encouraging our young people to take the courses that would interest them and give them the prerequisites to go into those courses. So uh, I, I would caution the Democrats not to overreach on the taxation and the regulatory side. I would caution them not to overreach with uh, the, the union issues which they have talked about, taking away the right of a person to have a secret ballot to join a union. Um, and I would say uh, that uh, it's going to be very, very important how we deal with health care. Um, I would say if I had to say what is the most important issue in our economy and especially with our populace and with our small business, it is the health care access issue. It is so important that we have innovative solutions to access to health care. Because if we don't get more people into the system, we're going to continue to have uh, people treated in the emergency rooms for, uh, for things that should either be prevented or treated in a doctor's office, which means more people have to have some kind of coverage. And that is something that we can do with innovations at the state level, uh, but I think also we could do much more at the federal level. Uh, we ought to have small business health plans at a very minimum, and uh, that has been blocked time and time again uh, in the United States Senate, well, in the United States Congress, which, which I think we've got to, to deal with. I would say that it is going to be so important for us uh, to try at the federal level uh, to cooperate and to give minority rights. And this is a little bit of an inside baseball thing. 
But at the federal level, it is somewhat like the state legislature, and that is that the House is much more structured toward the majority rule. In the Congress, they have a rules committee. Nothing can go to the floor of the United States House of Representatives that doesn't go through the Rules Committee. That's not only a bill, it is also an amendment. So every amendment has to go through the majority-dominated Rules Committee. The Senate, on the other hand, takes, a, takes 60 votes to do anything. We are probably going to end up with Democrats having 56 to 57, more likely 57. So that is very close to the 60 votes. And, but it is not 60 votes. So the Democrats are going to have to uh, reach across the aisle and let the Senate be the Senate if everything is not going to be blocked. I do not want to vote no for the next year. I don't want to vote no for the next two years or however long I'm there. I don't want to vote no all the time. But I will vote no every time if I don't have the right to offer amendments and to have a possibility of shaping legislation, because that is always the way the Senate has operated until the last two years. And the Senate has been more and more operated like the House, which is that a bill is brought up, cloture is filed, and there are no amendments. Well, that's not going to work. And it's not going to be good for our country if we don't have that capability to operate like the Senate. Our state Senate is somewhat that way, but much more collegial, of course, because in the state Senate, everyone loves Texas. That is not the case in the United States Senate. I'm always comforted um, when I look at how um, hard it is for Texas to get its fair share or a fair shake in the United States Senate. I'm always comforted by the fact that this is not new. They have never liked Texas in the United States Congress. In fact, going back to when Texas became a state, as you know, we are the only state that came into our nation as a nation. And it was by treaty, which took two-thirds vote in the Senate to ratify. However, they couldn't get the two-thirds vote to ratify the treaty bringing Texas into the United States. So President Tyler introduced legislation that adopted the treaty, but it had to go through the House and Senate. John Quincy Adams filibustered every day against that bill going through. And it passed the House eventually by one vote. And when it went to the Senate, finally, it also passed by one vote. So uh, we have never been the favorite in the United States, and that is still the case. So at least where you have the 11 votes to block a bill coming up, you know that everybody in the state Senate is going to uh, eventually come to terms because we all have the same goal of making Texas better. Well. In the United States Senate, uh, we are going to make sure that we have a say as the minority. And I think if we can work in that spirit, that we can accomplish a lot, which is what all of us want to do, uh, is to keep America going. Uh, we have a president-elect of the United States, and he is all of our president. And I will just end by saying that I thought both President-elect Obama and Senator McCain made two of the finest speeches I have ever heard on election night, both of them with the right tone. And John McCain said, we have a new president, and he is my president, and we are going to work together productively. And Barack Obama said, I realize that 46% of the people in America did not vote for me, and I'm your president too, and we are going to act accordingly. So with that, I hope that we do see a change in Washington, because it is not uh, the way that our country ought to operate. We all know that. So I hope that with uh, Speaker Pelosi and 
Majority Leader Reid, uh, that we will be able to work with our president-elect and do some of the things that we all know our country must do. We must win the war on terror. We cannot allow uh, the people that we are fighting to change our way of life, to take away our freedom, or to stop allowing our children to have the same opportunities that we have had growing up in the greatest nation on earth. And that's what the war on terror is about. And we can all agree to the goal. If we can just agree how to get there, that will be a positive step. We must deal with this financial meltdown. Uh, this is affecting everyone in our country. Every pension plan, every retiree, every person who has saved for college, uh, every person in our country who might lose a job or their homes, uh, it, will, it will be unacceptable uh, to not deal with this in a constructive way. But it is uncharted waters, and so we are going to have to do that in a positive and productive atmosphere. Uh, so there will be many things that we can do if we will just throw away the partisanship, and that's my goal, and I know it is that of every American. So thank you all very much. I thank the LBJ School. I uh, am very pleased that our dean of the LBJ School is working with the president-elect because um, I know that that will be a positive development as well. And thank you, Bill Powers, for the great job you're doing, and Ken Schein, our chancellor, uh, thank you very much as well. And thank you, Larry Temple and Bobby Inman, for all you do for the LBJ School. It's wonderful, um, and it's a great... Um, part of the, the new generation of leadership for our state, and I appreciate you very much. Thank you. I would be happy to take any questions until you tell me you have to go to the panel. Yes? Thank you. Labels. We keep using Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Conservative, so and so and so. And I work for the ACC Center for Public Policy and Political Studies. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is the fact that I think a lot of these labels are making us more partisan. I think saying terms like big ideas and relating it to a particular party is problematic for anyone to say that. And my, one of the reasons, <laughs> it is one, I, maybe I'll be allowed to leave nicely, but, uh, <laughs> and the reason why I'm concerned about that is because I'd be curious to see, and I know we have a wonderful history of our different parties, but I'd be curious to see if all those labels went away and we were just forced to work together without that, if that could make a difference. And I say that because at the center, one of the things that we try very hard to do is not have those types of policies involved in the programs. And I think one of the reasons why we have the difficulty in partisanship is that we're not teaching our youth to listen to speak and to work together. So I'm just curious about how do we move forward and use less of that type of language and use more of our love of each other and country? Well, let me say that I think when people run for public office, um, they do want to talk about views and issues and coming together. Um, and, and I think they seek the views of many diverse sources. That's what most people do. But at this point, at least, we have a party system that gives people the general idea of 
what the party stands for. And I think it is healthy to have that kind of framework, and particularly, I think it is healthy to have a two-party system as opposed to three, four, five, or six parties, because you do have to then bring the disparate views in your basic philosophy together under one umbrella. And it provides a clarity. I think the less stable democracies are the ones that have 25 parties, or five parties, or eight parties, because each one is more doctrinaire, which is what you're saying is a problem, and you haven't had to coalesce people into two parties and, and go for a majority vote with a majority rule. So I think the two-party system actually strengthens us rather than making us more weak. And I would hope that we would be able to have more of the mainstream uh, um, more mainstream activists in both parties. Because if the party gets too far on the fringe, whether it's to the right or to the left, it is not going to represent that solid majority. And that's when you start seeing then a uh, festering for a third party that would represent their views better. So um, I take your point about how we say things and, you know, I think uh, calling people liberal or conservative, many times that's self, um, uh, a self-description, but I think the important thing is that you be able to pick the party which most closely aligns with your philosophy and then try to shape that party because it is that inner tension within the party that creates a uh, majority, which I think is so important for clarity in a country. Um, and I hope that we can work within the two-party system to bring ourselves more center. One more question. Do we? I think she picked someone else, Dave. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm just curious. Were you aware at our morning panel that five state legislators all believed you're going to run for governor in 2010? Were you re <laughs> <laughs> I did hear something about that as I was walking in. I did. <laughs> well, I guess that was the last question. <laughs> Let, let me just say what I said uh, to that question a couple of, um, to a couple of news reporters, and it is that I think right now Texas and America has politics fatigue, and um, so I'm certainly intending to uh, begin to, to focus on that issue, but I would hate to have a story written tomorrow about that when I think people would just like to rest a little while. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, so much for sharing your, your time and your thoughts with us here today. The LBJ School and the university are better, better places for the Senator's support. And so we thank her not only for joining us here today, but for her continuing friendship. I hope you all will continue to enjoy your desserts. We will reconvene downstairs in Amphitheater 204 for the um, remaining.